From We First and Goal 17 Media, welcome to Lead with We. I'm Simon Mannering, and today I'm really excited to talk with a friend, an author, and scholar, Sherry Turkle, who studies how technology affects our lives and recently published just a fantastic memoir called The Empathy Diaries. So, Sherry, welcome to Lead with We. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Sherry, you're a tenured professor of psychology and sociology at MIT, and you've written several groundbreaking books about how we as individuals and society at large are changed, for better or worse, by rapidly advancing technology. And in fact, that's how we met, because you were at this conference talking about Alone Together, and I was at this conference talking about We First, and then I think, you know, you gave a presentation, and I came over to chat afterwards And then we kept chatting and we went to the next room and we moved on to the next room and outside and around the front yard. It was like we had this wonder, we locked horns the first time we met and it was such a great conversation. Right. I remember thinking it was very funny uh, as we were trying to find a place to just talk that like at so many uh, technology uh, meetings that I've gone to, how hard it is to just find a place to have a face-to-face conversation. Right. Uh, because the thing is set up to have you use technology in all of these exciting, new, innovative ways. And here were t- two people who really had something in common and just wanted a bad cup of coffee and to talk to each other. And people were coming in with all kinds of cameras to fill things, to do all kinds of complicated audiovisual things. And really, we just wanted our two bad styrofoam pieces of coffee. I know. It's <laughs> like, leave us alone. We want to go lo-fi. Right. It was, it we was the- perfect. We were so lo-fi. We were really so lo-fi. And, we you know, had a in- lot in common. We had a lot in common. We did have a lot in common. And it's interesting because our various theses at the time were in some ways not competitive, but it's interesting because you were writing about, you know, alone together and, you know, this arm's length intimacy that technology is enabling and is it good or bad for us. And I was talking about how brands and consumers use social media to build a better world. So I was casting a more positive light on the role of technology while you were telling a more cautionary tale. Would you say that's fair? Well, I think that I'm not anti-technology. Of course. I am pro-conversation. Yeah. And if technology brings people together to ultimately have significant conversations, necessary conversations, I am all in. Yeah. So I think that my work has been... um, mischaracterized in many ways as kind of, okay, here's the lady who doesn't like uh, technology. Yeah. Not at all. I like, I'm worried about technology when it makes us feel less vulnerable. People like to feel less vulnerable. They say, hey, I like this. I like communicating with less vulnerability. Maybe I'll do this instead of the hard work of really talking to somebody. I think that's very true. I think technology does become a surrogate for intimacy, either with ourselves or with others. And that comes at a great cost that is showing up now in data and depression and, you know, a lot of sort of hard metrics. But I think we just feel it each day, just emotionally. And and even more so during COVID, where we've been sort of forced to be separated from those most intimate relationships, you know, in our lives. I mean, what would you say the effect of COVID has been? Has this really compounded the problem? And do you think that's a good thing because it's thrown it into relief for us that we can actually see the issue? Well, I think that, you know, the first thing you have to say about technology and COVID is thank God we have the technology to be able to reach out and have something. In other words, I mean, I think that you have to begin after, you know, before you get into the niceties with the thank God. Right. You know, thank God that we can be talking like this. Thank God that I wasn't, that I could speak to my daughter, uh, whom I adore, even though I couldn't see her. I mean, you have to, you have to begin, thank God that parents could talk to their children. We could talk to aging right. parents. We could talk to, I mean, let's just begin with thank God instead, until we get into, oh, but, oh, but the problems, but the problems. Right. The problem is, is that there's a thing with technology if we're honest, where we go, it's better than nothing, which is what I just said, and I applaud that, till we start to say, you know, it's really better. It's not just better than nothing. For some purposes, it's really kind of better. So, for example, 
psychotherapists all over the country are starting to say, the sessions I had on Zoom with my patients who could be all over the world were really so rich and people were so honest and so relaxed and so in their home and, and their guard was down. I think it's better than having them come into the office. That makes, that makes sense. That's what, well, of course it makes a certain kind of sense. And we forget of what the presence of the body and what actually the effect of being in the same room with someone has on the kind of vulnerability you need to have the kind of empathy you need to be in an intimate relationship with your therapist. I, just I, think as we, I mean, so I'm just saying that that's the problem with what happens when we get into a love affair with technology, even during an emergency such as COVID. So we say, um, my God, uh, you know, and so here's, here's on the plus side, here's what I think happened during um, COVID mm -hmm. is that parents, I was doing studies that showed before the pandemic people were kind of softening up to the idea of online education. You know, my, my child will have, a, you know, screen applications that will be personalized. The best teachers in the world can educate him or her. Uh, every keystroke, every mistake, every vulnerability in learning will be recorded and the AI will, will make sure to compensate for that and give, et cetera, et cetera. That'll be fantastic. Now, when a parent is presented with that kind of opportunity, a parent says, excuse me, excuse me, could you please give my child a person? Right. I think my child needs a mentor, a right. real mentor. I don't want an AI. I want a mentor for my child, someone who will talk to my child and love my child and value my child as a person. You know, so, it's inter it, what you're really pointing to is that this technology can almost digitize us. It can sort of, we can erase our humanity in a way. And help us understand, Sherry, I mean, you've drawn this arc from Alone Together through Reclaiming Conversation to this book about empathy. What is the, the core of that narrative that your life's work has been building? Like, what is that itch that you've constantly been trying to scratch? Is it our connection to ourselves and each other? Or is it the connection between technology and humanity? Or is it about putting technology to the best ends? Like what is that sort of thematic that's been carried through? The thematic is that technology makes us a promise that we are very vulnerable to, which is that we can be with each other without being vulnerable. Right. That is the that is the crack cocaine. That is, people talk is it addictive? Is it addictive? You just have to remember you have the promise of intimacy without vulnerability. And, and that really is you know, you can have a lover but he doesn't have to know like the worst part. You can have intimacy without telling the thing that you, oh, no, not that. That is really what people, without being able always to articulate it, that, that's the promise. You can just turn it off when you want. So one young man who loved texting said to me, I said to him, why are you always texting? Why don't you talk to this woman? He had a yeah, crush sure. on another 18-year-old. And he said, conversation? I'll tell you what's wrong with conversation. It happens in real time, and you don't always know what the other person is going to say. Right. So it's this preemptive strikes and, you know, you really want to, mm -hmm. you know, but this is so important to business, Sherry. It's so important yes. to business. And I want to talk about your memoir in a moment. But like, I feel like the, the distinction in our minds, if whether you're a leader or an employee or whatever it might be, this distinction between who we are personally and who we are professionally. And then who we are professionally together has a huge impact on the type of leaders we are and what we can achieve together. And I've always felt, you know, I was a staff guy for years. 
you know, sometimes you walk in the door and you put on this professional avatar of yourself and you talk in a certain way and show up in a certain way. And it's almost implicit that you're not allowed to be vulnerable. Things, you know, they always have to be okay. You always have to be going to, you know, and, but what you're saying is that there's power in that vulnerability, correct? Yes. There's tremendous power in vulnerability because vulnerability really says, you know, I'm okay with who I am really. And I know that everybody is vulnerable and that's part of a true self. And I'm so confident about being a true self that I don't mind if you see it because that's part of my, that's my superpower. Well, I want to ask you a question. That is my, I feel that in writing the empathy diaries, people say, well, aren't you embarrassed? I mean, it it, it says your husband was unfaithful to you. I mean, I said, with this book, I, I now have a superpower is that I'm saying I didn't live a perfect life. I did the best I can. And my superpower is that I am whole. Right. And that means when I tell you something, I'm not trying to hide. I'm not, I'm, you're getting the truth from me. And I think that makes a leader because that's somebody you can trust. I think that's very true. And I think, you know, I've been reflecting on this lately myself, you know, Sherry, I was sort of asking myself and talking to my wife about this the other night, you know, do we really spend our whole lives waiting to be seen or do we really spend our whole lives learning to reveal ourselves? Yes. Because we're the ones hiding. Yeah. We're the ones hiding because, you know, help me understand this. If you're a leader, you're a CEO, you're a boss, you're, you know, you're an entrepreneur just starting a small team. How do you introduce that vulnerability? Is it like, you go first and others will follow because that's hard in in a corporate environment. Or is it like you create a safe space and you give everyone permission to be human and vulnerable in that space and you institutionalize it. Like at my company, we first every week we'll have strengths and stretches and you talk about what's good in your life, what's not, what you're working on. Like you, you, you build a program for it. Like how do you elevate it inside an organization? Well, I think this, this is where I think leadership is very important because a good leader looks very deep and says, what am I comfortable with? Right. Not what program did I see online or what did I, you know, what did I check and what will I try? But looks at all of those and says, what, what would be good for me in order to show myself as the kind of person I really am? And, um, in my classes, for example, just to show you how I do it, mm-hmm. I have everybody talk about an object of significance to them. And I say, look, I'm going to talk about an object of significance, and it's usually something from childhood, but it could be from now. And it has to be something where it's, it's your head and your heart and your hopes in it. Head, heart, hopes. Okay. Because it's, it's MIT. It's a classroom. It's not the place to just be bringing in, you know, Is that just to unlock them a little bit, to get them out of their head and more towards their heart? Is that why? But it's not the place to be, you know, just, just, you know, bringing in, you know, kind of, you know, stories from the past out of the blue. But I want to show you that thought and feeling are well, that when you're studying psychology, it's the mind and the body and the, and, you know, it's cognition and feeling and also the body. Head, heart, hope, object, because you're scientists and engineers and designers, you're making things. Let me tell you, after 10 people have gone around a class talking about an object, people, and I'm talking about my grandmother's, her best dishes, which I talk about in my book, there's not a dry eye when people are doing that. So I've found a way that's authentic to me to talk about design where I reveal a lot. Yeah. About my family, my background, the Holocaust, what it meant to have dinner together in that family in Brooklyn. But it's it's not exhibitionistic, no. but it's leading them to where I want them to be. In a design firm, you might do something di- similar. What have you designed and what did it mean to you? Right. But it's, it's always by the particular leader going deep into themselves and saying, what would be comfortable for me? It sounds like in your firm, you have something that works for you. Yeah, I think that vulnerability is so important to leadership moving forward. And I'm encouraged because, you know, you see all these CEOs around different issues like gun control and other things 
really just saying we're doing it because it's the right thing to do or enough is enough. They're kind of talking and responding in human ways. But I want to put my hand up and raise an objection to, to this. I struggle in my life to even know who I am. And I was, again, I was talking to my wife about this the other night. You know, like when you put on the hat of a father, a husband, um, a, a business owner, a boss, a friend, you kind of build these sort of like layers or different expressions of yourself on top. And, you know, I was asking myself the question, the way that I show up in the world right now, how aligned is that with who I was when I was 17, 18, 19 or 20 before all those responsibilities were layered on top? I share that only because this is what a, a leader in a company, large or small, faces. So, you know, how do you overcome the challenge of knowing yourself so that you can actually be vulnerable and reveal it to others? Isn't that a preceding step in a way? Well, um, I think one thing you can do, you know, I think when you speak the truth of where you are and where you've been, you never get into trouble. Right. So one thing you can do is you can say, I think as we're coming out of the pandemic, one of the things that I'm talking about a lot now is the process of mourning, is the process of grief. Right. Everybody, for example, wants to say the return, like, you know, like, we're, like this is great. You know, yeah. we're back. We're you know, back. Hold on. Hold on. We've had grief. There is mourning. Yeah. And every, you know, I don't say everyone knows, because unfortunately everyone doesn't know, but the process of mourning means you have to acknowledge loss. In my book, I talk about my mother died when I was in college and I was totally not ready for her to die. And I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it at all. So I ideal, idealized her. We were in the pro, we were in the middle of a terrible, terrible set of arguments. She had not let me know my father or speak my father's name or use my father's name, but we, we couldn't talk about it. So instead of being able to be angry at her or to, or to deal with any of that, I idealized her. Right. And it took me 20 years to be able to really reconcile with her. And instead I didn't mourn her. I just idealized her. What right. you, and we are in danger of doing that with this pandemic. It's not like we're back. We, some things have happened that we need to talk about. Yep. Some things about the pandemic have been good for some of us. Some of us has ne have needed a break from the crushing of the everyday. Some people have used the time to rest. Some people have been, it's been good for them not to travel. I've had, I mean, let me go first. I've had fewer migraines during right. the pandemic. I have to reevaluate my life. Yeah, I need I, to admit, hey, people, fewer migraines. I need to think about what, about myself. Why that, that is means. and what's it? Yeah, no, I, I love the lack of travel. And I, I right. hope that everybody is not going to rush back to what, well, I don't know, was the way things were before, almost as a default, despite the fact that a lot of industries or businesses will encourage us to do so. Well, we so have when to you... speak up. We have yeah. to speak up and we have to mourn. But mourning means acknowledging that there's something that we've lost that we need to acknowledge and bring inside and own. Th that's really what I'm saying yeah. is that we need to be honest. Your, your question was, what does it mean to acknowledge the many layers of who we are? Yeah. And it means acknowledging who we were in the past and what we bring forward to where we are now. If there's something in your past, this is very interesting in my class at MIT, we read Oliver Sacks, okay. who for yep. many, many years, a great writer, a great- The thinker, man who great... mistook his wife for a hat? Yes, and yeah. he, he, he denied for so many years large parts of who he was. And it wasn't until he came to terms with, 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 with the many layers of who he was that he became the genius that he became. Yeah. So I would say that, you know, that that starting to talk about what this past year has meant for us, being with our families more or having more time in solitude or being lonely and being able to acknowledge that somehow, that being able to find all these layers in ourselves and share that with other people and allow this vulnerability 
we can come out stronger. I, I completely agree. And I'll, t I'll share with you, Sherry, literally earlier today, I was on a call with a, a work call and I asked the guy, how are you doing? And I hadn't spoken to him in a long time. And he said, okay, just okay. And I heard in that the permission to be real myself. And I said, he said, how have you been? And I said, it's been tough. It's been lonely sometimes. And there's so much power and permission in these words that we're otherwise not allowed to admit of ourselves. Right. So, you know, would you say that there is a silver lining? It's a tragic silver lining. But between COVID and the relentlessness of these life and death stakes, and then the, the tragedy of, you know, the fallout of the Black Lives Matter movement in terms of just throwing in our face the social inequities and things that we've got to deal with, it's almost like... The, 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 the surroundings have thrust these emotional issues to the forefront of our lives, to the front of our, our eyes, and we've had to deal with them. Do you feel that that's a good thing in a sense, that we can't hide them, we can't bury them as easily because they've been so visceral and present in front of us? Yes, you know, there, there's a wonderful concept in anthropology called liminal or betwixt and between, and that's what we have now. We have a time of great privilege because it's a betwixt and between time. It's a time in these times that are the old old rules don't work, the new rules aren't written. We get to see our country anew. We get right. to see our politics anew. We get to see white privilege anew. We get to see social inequity anew. We get we, we just get to see we get to step out of the Fourth of July parade in a way right. that many of us have not. And we get to say, okay. I am seeing this. Now, different people will do different things, but the mere fact of seeing for such a wide group of people and acknowledging is, is going to mean that, that we are going to be a different country. And I am not at all, um, uh, I don't think that the sort of um, nostalgia for the restoration I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the way. So help, you know, it's, it's in a sense easy to talk about this in theory, but I think one of the reasons this tension between humanity and technology has got so acute is that it's really hard to balance the two. So after we've had this crisis and we have this opportunity to sort of elevate and sustain the priority of our connection to each other and conversation and so on, how do we in business institutionalize that? Because God knows, you know, artificial intelligence and IoT and everything else is escalating exp exponentially, yet the human equivalent isn't. So, or we don't have the skills or the tools. So as you teach at MIT and as you look to business and, and counsel all these business leaders, how do you elevate humanity to the same degree? How do you build it in? How do you prioritize conversation? How can we all listening to this kind of, help reset the balance? Well, first of all, there are some, there, there are some very basic things. Uh, you know, we have seen Congress approach Mark Zuckerberg with such ignorance. Yeah. With a degree of kind of, you know, not three years into his company, not six years into his company. What was it, 15 years into his company when he made that first, I mean, with with an ignorance that, um, I mean, I pay taxes, I happily pay taxes so that my representatives will be able to look out for my- Your interests. Yeah. Interests. Hire a consultant so that when you interview Mark Zuckerberg, like, you know what his business does, people. Right. I mean, that's not calling for revolution. That is absolutely being a citizen and saying, excuse me, the end, I mean, this is I'm not I'm not even suggesting particular policy changes here. I'm saying yeah. everybody has to get on it and say the most important industries now are digital. My lawmakers have to be all over this, right? All over this. This is because when I interview people, still, they talk about Facebook as one of the free luxuries of life. Right. Now that is the success. Because I mean, I, I'm an honest researcher. If I if I had some happy story to tell you about how the revolution has come, I would share it. I interview people who talk about Facebook as one of the free luxuries of life. If you have 
a marketing campaign that has convinced the populace that Facebook is a free luxury of life, you have one great marketing campaign. Sure. That, that requires a political response. Yeah. A lot of people have to learn that Facebook is not a free luxury of life and nor Google searches. And actually, nor are all the applications. I happen to have my, my, um, um, my iPhone on because yeah. I'm recording this conversation have, so you yeah. can have a backup tape. Yeah. My iPhone turned on means that my iPhone is collecting information. Different apps on my iPhone is, are collecting information yeah. about so much about where I am, what I'm saying, <laughs> the timbre of my voice. I've lost my voice. Health applications are worried that I'm ill. I mean, I, I don't even, I can't even keep track anymore as I try to turn these things off. You're a, you're a set of data points now. I'm a set of data points that, you know, soon, by tonight, I'll be getting, you know, ads for Robitussin and it's because I sound like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking. I'm no, not absolutely. joking. So um, we simply have to treat this as a political problem not as a mystery um, that has a, um, you know, that we can track. And one of my favorite, you know, every author has like a favorite line they've written. You know, they, sure. call, them your, they call them your darlings. And your you're darlings, to, yeah, 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 your of darlings, course. And you're supposed to take them out, but I have one that I love. It was from my TED Talk in, in 2012, and it's mm -hmm. just because we grew up with the Internet, we think the Internet is all grown up. Right. Which means that just because we were babies when it was a baby, we say things like the horse is out of the barn, it's got to be the way it's got to be, it's too late. It is not too late. I mean, you know, it's like saying when the Model T was marching around without, without a top and without, you know, certainly without any kind of protection for the driver or anything, well, you know, the car was invented. There it goes, you know. It's and like, just let it let it do its let thing. It, let yeah. it do its thing. That car. That car can. That car can go. What an incredible thing that car. No, we we need to manage it, and you hear a lot of dialogue around the need to make sure that you know humanity doesn't serve technology, but rather technology authentically serves us. And you know, as as we look to the future, I think but each of us. Simon, is, can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah, please, I, just, I really please. want to nail this point. Okay. Because I feel that this is so important. This is a political problem. And too many people shy away from that final, that final, I mean, I'm stopping you, and it's not out of lack of respect. Yeah. Too many people shy away from making that final point that to get this done, in the United States, you have to get involved with your elected representatives. This is a political problem. It, it doesn't have to do with whether or not you love Google or, you know, really like what they say. This is a problem of industries that need to be controlled. It's not whether or not people have their heart in the right place. I think that's a fair point because I think what we are seeing is this a greater call for participatory multi-stakeholder capitalism. Like you can't leave it to anybody else. Your choices daily affect the impact on the planet, what companies are enabled to succeed and grow, who are penalized. And in the same way, you're really calling for, we've got to embrace the you know, participation in the democratic process as well. And we've got to be clear-eyed about it and we've got to know what's really yes. going on. Yes, because I still, because the, the advantage of my method where I interview people face to face is that I, I still talk to young people who right. say, wow, it's good that I don't have really a great desire to get involved in politics because anything I say would be captured online and everything I say would be known to everybody. Nothing is private and I'm so afraid of that. Right. So essentially, we are moving towards a society without wanting to that so suppresses speech because people are so afraid of who is going to get a hold of their speech. Understood, understood. And, and you know, it's a complicated issue you're pointing to here because I want to ask a broader question, which is how should we 
understand or think about our relationship to relationship to technology moving forward. But factoring into that are a couple of things. For example, social media, as we all know, algorithmically sort of bifurcates reality. You know, if you have one point of view and you're interested in certain things, it'll send you more information to that effect and you double down on how you're already thinking. At the same time, you know, we're being used as data set points as, as you were talking about earlier on. And so like if, if we're being scraped for data, if we don't even agree on what reality we're trying to solve for, but we can't deny our intimate connection to technology now, how do we look at it? Do we go, this is friend? Do we go, it's foe? Do we look at it and go, okay, I just need to be informed and intentional about this? Like as an ongoing important relationship in our life, how should we look at technology? I think you have to see technology as in two ways. Uh, we have to stop thinking that we're going, let me back up. When I came to MIT and I argued technology was an intimate machine, a second self, a Rorschach, people said, oh, Sherry, you'll never get tenure. It's just a tool. This is the story I tell in the Empathy Diary. So yeah. I was arguing it was an, an intimate machine and people saying it's just a tool. You'll never get tenure. It's just a tool. And I would say, no, no, look, people are connecting to it. It's, so, it's culturally so important, psychologically so important. And they were saying it's just a tool. And, and that was my struggle. And in a way, your question is about that struggle. Yeah. And in the end... Both sides are right. I was right. It's changed our culture. It's changed our psychology. It's changed the way we think. But MIT was right too. It's just a tool. And we have to master it as a tool. So I suggest you approach technology on a kind of multi-track. You're on multiple tracks, just like you're on multiple tracks. You're a career, you're a father, you're a lover, you're a husband, you're, you're we, we live all of our life on multiple tracks. Yeah. I don't stop being a mother when I go to work and I want to be like a crack social science researcher. I don't say, oh, what is it going to be today? I, nobody lives like that. Technology is changing the way we think. It's messing with our mind. It's, 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 it's interfering with our ability to solve certain kinds of problems because it's dumbing those problems down in many cases. And so, but, mm. but... It also is saving lives. It's also opening up vistas that we never thought were possible. It's also making this conversation possible, which I'm finding like really helpful to me in thinking about the hardest questions that are before us. Yeah. We, don't, we don't gain points by making rules. We gain points by looking at the complexity of these things, of this thing, and saying, when I think about Facebook and how it scrapes my data, here's what I'm going to do. Right. When I look at social media and how I have to behave in order to pu publicize my book, here's how I'm going to behave. Sure. You know, it's it's a we we need a sense of personal mastery in this new, very complicated area of life. It's no, like it saying, is. How, it's a relationship I, we've got to manage. Yeah. Like, how should I approach books? Well, I'll approach the pornographic ones in one way, mm -hmm. and I'll approach uh, Jane Austen in a different way. You know, and this, you know, this points to something I wanted to ask about your book. Um, for those who are listening on, on um, a podcast, you know, you can't see it, but I'm holding it up here, The Empathy Diaries. And it is, it, it, the writing itself is exquisite, and I say that out of enormous respect as a fellow writer. I just want to say that. I mean, it's... Thank you. Um, exquisite is a very pointed word and um, I choose it very consciously. So just so much admiration for that. At the same time, you know, you look at something called the Empathy Diaries and you might look at it and go, it's a look back because it walks through the various stages of your life. But I, I also hear it as a sort of a cri de coeur, a call to arms to practice empathy moving forward on a daily basis. Yes. Would you say that's fair? Absolutely. It is a cri de coeur. I think the best way, I'm trained in the psychoanalytic tradition, and so uh, somebody who's trained like that uh, doesn't tell, they show. Right. And the only thing you can show is what's happened to you. Right. And so I show, through examples from my life, 
how empathy shown to me by others transformed me so that I can say, look, look at what that did to me. Let me dissect that and show you how a relationship with a computer is not going to do that for you or your child. Right. Move forward with that information. So I'll give you a good example. I was very unconfident as a college student. I came from a high school in Brooklyn, a big public high school. Right. Honestly, I, I, I went to Harvard. I like, I, I'd read review books to get there. I'd memorized stuff. I'd done well on tests. I thought everybody deserved to be there with, except me. And a, great, um, and a great historian, Barrington Moore, took me aside and he said, you know, um, you know, you may, you may not be polished, but get an idea that really is your passion and just keep working it. And right. basically he said, even though you're a woman and there are no women who have tenure at Harvard, just if your passion corresponds to the thing you're doing, you'll never regret a minute that you spend trying. That's powerful. What a gift he gave you. What a gift. Because yeah. I just said, okay, so let's say I try and I fail. Every moment that I spend trying, I will not have just been sort of, you know, trying at something that somebody told me to do, told me to do. To, I will have pursued my passion. Absolutely. And I, and I pass it on. And yeah, I do think that ultimately passing that on is the greatest gift. The right. gift is given to you, not for you to hold on to, but to pass on to somebody else. What empathy? Because he understood exactly my problem. He didn't just understand my place, which was as a poor woman from Brooklyn who was lost there. He understood my problem. Could I use this as a day job? And right. he thought to himself, if I had her problem, I'd be worried that at the end of all this, I'd have nothing. And he said, if that was my problem, I would want a great ride along the way. Right. I wouldn't be worried that I wouldn't have enough money to finally get a job at the end. I'd worry that I would have just wasted my time. He put himself in my problem and he said, never feel you've wasted a minute of your time. You have fun. You love this thing. And I tell that to my students. I think it's, I, it's a huge life lesson and also the fulfillment it gives you because you feel fully revealed and yes. seen as an extension of that. And the, the, to, to your point, what computer could have given me that advice? Right. Right. That's my, and then, that's my point. I mean, to come, <laughs> to come full circle, I mean, you know, we met 10 years ago and, and you had a certain outlook, you know, um, with a loan together. And we've since had this exponential experience of technology ever since and all these challenges on a human level most acutely the last couple of years. How has your point of view changed over the last 10 years? How has it evolved? Because it always does in some way. Uh, I'm both more optimistic and more pessimistic. I'm more optimistic because things I said 10 years ago that people were saying were revolutionary and I should not say them too loud or say them in a corner or, you know, right. kind of like when they were, I was sort of a boutique item. Now, like, it seems like everybody understands them and so what. Um, so I feel like more successful in that, like people say alone together and they don't even know it's the name of my book. We've been yeah. alone together. Or we've been yeah. together alone. We've been <laughs> sort of like, they're You've not entered the vernacular. You've entered exactly. the vernacular. Yeah. Exactly. They're not even quoting me. I think that's fantastic. I yeah. think that's just like, that's the best. Um, so I feel very successful. On the other hand, I'm very pessimistic in a certain way because I, it's very hard to, um, you know, when I interview people who talk about Facebook as one of life's free luxuries and who still don't understand what is being done with their data and the way that contributes to a, um, uh, an undermining of democracy, right. an, individual, an individual autonomy. Yeah, and self-determination. And, and self-determination. Yeah. It's hard not to be frightened. Yeah. Right. And I think this is true of all of these large platforms that are seamlessly just infused our whole lives. I don't think it's unique to Facebook. I think it's the nature of how we exist now. I, I want to ask you another question, you know, just in terms of 
the experience of writing the Empathy Diaries itself. You know, you've written these, you know, business books, these technology focused books, and now you've done a memoir. And what I've found in the writing process is, is that you learn something very powerful by writing the book itself. Like I always find I don't quite know what I'm writing about until I've written it. And then I go, oh, this is what I was writing about all the way along. It teaches right. me a lesson. What lesson did you take away from, from writing such a, such a special and personal book? That empathy is where, that empathy is what I've been trying to write about all along. If you'd right. asked me 10 years ago, what's the theme of your work? I wouldn't have said, well, empathy, obviously. I mean, I was, of course, writing That's about That's super it. interesting. It's true. If you look back at all of your books, yeah. Reclaiming Conversation, and so right. it's all about what's intermediating, what's getting in the right. way, what are we losing, what are we gaining, right. you know? But I didn't see it. I didn't, I didn't see it. I would have said conversation. I, I mean, I, I had all kinds of other ways of thinking. And, and there was a clarification. There was a clarification, a purification of my message and that brought it back to my personal life and my personal struggles. Right. Because I talk about how empathy for me really wasn't a given. People were not empathic to me in my life. I had to struggle to get empathic communication. And um, and that struggle made it all the more important to me. That doesn't mean I'm always the most empathic person in the world. But when I'm not, I never take it lightly. In other words, when I'm not, I'm not like, oh, well, you know, next time. You know, I really, I really go back and think about it and struggle with it and try to do better. And well, it's, help, it's help us, important. all of us listening to this or watching. You know, we've all got, we're pulled in so many directions every day in terms of the roles we play, let alone all the competition for our attention. But as a daily intentional mindful practice, give us a couple of pointers about as individuals or as bosses or as leaders or as employees or whatever it might be, how can we practice empathy? Are there a few things we can do? Yes. If you're an employer, begin your day with each person you meet on your job and try to meet a few more of them, actually, in your job. Not by assuming you know what they're thinking, but say, but with, in a position of humility, by assuming you do not know what they're thinking. Right. Empathy begins with not, oh, I know what they're, you know, I know how you feel. I, I've been divorced. I have been there. Right. That's not empathy. Empathy is, I don't know how you feel. Tell me how you feel. It's the assumption that you don't know how they feel, but you're there to listen. And secondly, so that's the first thing. Come to each person with the humility that you actually want to hear. Sure. Not that you're not, not that you kind of uh huh, uh -huh you know. Yeah, we're all we're all guilty of it. We're, <laughs> we're all, all guilty you know, of it. We're all guilty of it. Or or oh my God, yes, I'm I'm so ready to go back to work. You know. Go, Post-pandemic, yes. No, I'm you know. not. I just want a glass of wine and cry yeah, and go to exactly, sleep or whatever. Exactly, or whatever. I just I just can't wait to have drinks with you all. Well, maybe yeah. there's somebody who actually hated those drinks yep. and wouldn't dare tell you that. Sure. And who, um, so that's the first thing is, is humility, listening, the assumption of sort of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I think is... Um, uh, come to a conversation with with commitment the thing about barrington moore and about the other people i describe who were empathic with me is that they um they committed themselves to me now it wasn't like i mean i don't want to you know exaggerate what they sure. did but I, at one point i lost my scholarship on a technicality my my i had a stepfather who wanted me to come home and take care of, um, I had a half sister and brother, and he wanted me to drop out of Harvard and you know take care of them. He said that in the old country, this is what would happen. Well, we weren't in the old country and I wanted to continue school. Sure, well, that makes and, sense. Um, I lost, you know, I lost my scholarship and these, you know, these were white male old school professors, but when I lost my scholarship, um, even though it was against the rules, uh, they found a way to 
find a scholarship for me, even though there was no parents' confidential statement or whatever there was. I mean, they sort of found a way to make it happen so I could go back and finish my college degree. Uh, it would have been the easiest thing in the world. I mean, I was just one among many. I wasn't like a, I wasn't famous. I wasn't like, it wasn't like I was like writing books or anything. I was sure. just, you know, a college half finished with her junior year. Hadn't done anything yet, but I I'd had a bump in my road and they understood my problem. And they said, bend the rules for her in the long run. It'll be worth it. I, I, I mean, they, I don't think we can overstate how transformative an empathetic approach like that can be. That changed my life. Yeah. I mean, it changed my life. So if you have a chance to bet on somebody, I mean, I can't tell you how easy it would have been to not bet on me. I looked yeah. like, I was going to say I looked like shit. I mean, I really was. I mean, there are pictures in the book and the pictures from those years. I am a bedraggled person. I mean, yeah. you know, I. <laughs> I was very bedraggled. We, we, we've was, all had our we've all had our humbling I, days. I mean, I was I was depressed. My mom had just died. I had not. I mean, I was just a bedraggled soul. Yeah. If you have a chance to bet on somebody, to listen to them, to understand them, hear them, and commit to them, and right. make that part of your empathy. Make empathy an action, not just a listening. And those well, are I my just... two. Pieces of advice. I mean, I'd love to encourage everyone to take the time to invest in themselves by reading the Empathy Diaries, because I think, you know, it's one thing to understand this intellectually. It's another to have a visceral experience in the practice of it. It kind of provides a blueprint for how you can apply it to your own lives. And, and I think the book does that so beautifully, but so effectively as well. So Sherry, so nice to see you and thank so you nice. for sharing your insights and you know everyone please go and grab the empathy diaries and um, give that gift to yourself so thank you for your time sherry thank you thanks for joining us for this week's episode of lead with we you can find out more about today's guest in the description of the show below and if you like this episode do subscribe by clicking the red button Lead With We is produced by Goal17 Media, and you can also listen to it on Google, Apple, or Spotify. So I'll see you next week, and until then, let's all lead with we.